Welcome to the Rapport Advantage Podcast, transforming the way leaders communicate. Here's your host, human behavior expert and professional speaker, Alex Swire Clark. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the show, everyone. This is another geek out day for yours truly here because when I get people all that are meaningful and are special in my life, I kind of, you know, <laughs> get kind of uh, blown up. But I have with me today just a wonderful mentor in my speaking and professional career, the lovely, talented Jane Atkinson. Jane, so good to have you on the show. Oh, I'm so excited to be here, Alex. This is awesome. Congratulations on the success of your show. Thank you. Thank you. We're slowly growing steadily and the speaking business is growing, so we're absolutely fired up. I want to give the listeners a quick intro. As an expert in the speaking industry, Jane Atkinson has been helping speakers catapult their careers for nearly 30 years. She's the author of Wealthy Speaker 2.0, the Epic Keynote, and the Wealthy Speaker Daily Success Planner and Journal. Prior to coaching speakers, she worked as an agent for several speakers whose careers skyrocketed. Jane also served as vice president of a speaker's bureau in Dallas, where she represented several celebrities, best-selling authors, and business experts. Jane's Wealthy Speaker University offers online and private coaching programs, of which I have participated in, for speakers at all levels, helping speakers position to gain those almighty higher fees. Talk to me, Jane. Woo! <laughs> intro I've ever had. I love it. Thank you for all those sound effects. You are welcome. You're welcome. Well, obviously, you have played a large part. Uh, we go back in you know, almost 18 months ago when I came to you as this little shy, timid, I don't know what to do with my speaking life uh, situation. And you've been so helpful uh, and, and getting me started on the path. And, and so I can't thank you enough. And thanks for being on the show today. Well, you know, you have to give yourself a lot of credit because I give the same information to everyone, Alex. And some people will go out and they'll do what we call hashtag focus hustle. And <laughs> some people will continue to kind of throw money at it and try to solve the problem without actually taking any action. And you are the focus hustle action taker. And that's why it's working for you. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. We're, uh, we're a team here at, uh, at Team Swire Clark. So let's get down into some dirty questions right quick if we can. Sure. So sure. Fr from the speech standpoint, we're going to have folks out there who are listening who are CEOs, VPs, C-suite folks. They've got to make that major presentation to board members or whomever. What makes a good speech? Well, I think that probably the biggest thing to consider is your stories because people do not remember bullet points or a uh, long list of things. What they really latch on to, uh, I think Mark Sanborn called it mental coat pegs, is the stories. And so even when you are giving a work presentation, a lot of times building story into that can make it more meaningful for the people who are listening. And, and we've heard storytelling has been picking up steam uh, over the course of the last few years. And it's just a really important part. And so I would say that that's probably the key idea. A lot of speeches try to do too much in our industry, maybe not necessarily for a CEO. But um, when you are going out and delivering a presentation, you know, three points is about all anybody can remember. And if you can whittle it back, the TED Talks have shown us that one point is really all that you need. And I think that's why the TED Talks have taken off in such a dramatic way is because it's about one killer point. And that's what makes a great speech. Awesome. You, you mentioned storytelling a minute ago. One of the people that you coach, Miss Kendra Hall, is a tremendous storyteller. And uh, she was on the platform not too long ago at uh, a big NSA convention and uh, just rocked it off the planet. So what are some keys for, for Kendra's success in your mind? Well, Kendra had a really, so that is one of, you, you kind of spelled it out there. Kendra has an epic keynote and having an epic keynote is the first part of really creating a booming company for yourself and building a really good business. And, and I was thinking about that today as whether or not Kendra was on kind of the front edge of the wave or she's just been lucky that storytelling has kind of its time. People didn't always get it. Ten years ago, I don't know if she would have had as easy of time getting to the successful place that she did. But the second thing that she did, so number one, 
epic presentation. Number two, Focus Hustle, which in her case was to send out 600 emails, very short and sweet, well-written emails. She decided 100 a week for six weeks, and that's what launched her. She was very specific and sent them out to the American Marketing Association thinking that they would be appreciative of the storytelling topic, and they were, and that has led her into a lot of her Fortune 100 work that she's doing today. So she hasn't done just one series of 600. She's done waves over and over again of 600. So all you salespeople listening out there, that focused hustle, get after it, do the things that other people won't do to get the results that other people want to have. Yeah, we had this fun little ditty that seemed to take on a life of its own at one of my live events. It was, pick up the phone, pick up the phone, pick up the phone. (laughs) And I thought you might appreciate that. I think it was somebody's ringtone or something. I don't know where I got it from, but it just ended up being like this little dance that we would do like every, every three or four hours when the energy was getting low. We would talk about picking up the phone and really picking up the phone or sending an email is taking action is what it's all about. And that's why you've done so well is because you've done just that. Well, we try to follow the styles and the rules that you tell me. to do. <laughs> hey, Alex, go do this. Okay. Yes, ma'am. You know, because if I don't, then I come back to my next coaching session. It's going to be, um, did you get your stuff done? Well, uh, oh no, sorry, Jane. I'm so sorry. And then Jane beats me up with a very long pole from Canada and it's not, not that's very fun. That's right. Right through the screen of the computer. That's right. Very, very much so. So <laughs> let's talk about actually on the stage or on the platform. So when you talk to your clients about those first few speeches that they're trying to give, how do you and, and what types of tips do you give them to cope with those pre-talk nerves? Well, one of the things that I was taught early on was about the value of oxygen getting to the brain. So my boss, uh, my old boss, Vince Pacenti, one of the speakers that I represented who went from zero to a million very quickly, he recognized that oxygenating the brain was important. So taking 10 long, deep breaths allows you to get oxygen to the brain and that allows you to think better. And that's what we just really need to be as sharp as we possibly can be. And the reason why sometimes people get into that mode of, you know, deer in the headlights, oh no, I don't remember where I was going, was because they haven't been breathing. So that's one thing. The second thing that we talk about in, uh, we document it almost every day in the Wealthy Speaker Journal is what is your mantra? You know, what is the mantra that you want to have before you go on stage? One of the things that I like, and I'm going to speak later on today. So it's be kind, be humble, be sharp. So being sharp is important to me. And and I do, at whatever age I am, have to remind myself to be sharp because it doesn't always come as easy as I want. So the breathing is helpful. But also be kind and be humble because it's easy when you're the person of authority in the front of the room to start to make yourself into some sort of big shot. And I have to remind myself that you know what, these are people who I want to be kind to. I am not the star of the show here. It's really about them. And those things help me remind myself of that and put myself into, you know, more of a servant position than trying to put myself up on a pedestal or something. Right. And as D's and I's, when we talk about the disc mindset, as D's and I's, that's a very difficult struggle for us because it's usually all about us. We're the outgoing people. We're there to, you know, to put on the show, the glitz and glamour. And hey, I've got all this content to give. It's going to be great. And we wait a minute. Without the people out there, Turn it around. There is no Make it about them. Make it about them. And I think that is actually another really good tip back to the first one for, say, the CEO who might, might be listening in. When you can make it about them and hit on their pain points and tell them that you understand, that changes everything. When it's just about you and the company, it's like, okay, great, yay. But when you can really make it about them, and I understand we've got, you know, a new system that we've been struggling with for a long time now. And, you know, we're, we're working on that. You know, I think that it just tells people that you're listening to them. Right. And I think in my speeches, it's kind of a cheat code for me because when I'm using DISC, 
it's usually all about them anyway because I yeah. have them take an assessment and like, oh, I never knew that X, Y, or Z. Or, and then they start thinking about, well, my wife is not that. She said this. And so it generates a lot of buzz in the room and things like that because I, I am focused so much on them. It's never about me. The stories... For they can sure. appreciate and accent what I'm trying to convey, like the story about me and the Taco Bell line with my wife, which, you know, it goes crazy. But they don't have to get involved with me. It's just about them. And it's continuing about them. And right. it's more about them. And it's all about them until the very end. And so people come back and say, oh, this is amazing. It was, well, it's not really amazing. It's it's just, it's all about you. And so, yeah, and that's why you love it is because it is all about you. That's right. Yay. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So speaking yeah. of someone who's a rock star um, and who, who reaches the audience, let's talk about Ryan Estes for a minute. Ryan, tremendous on the stage, tremendous with the way he does his operations, the way he does his marketing. He's just, he's just polished in every possible way. What do you think Ryan's biggest strength is? I would say that he is very good at pulling people towards him. So he's relatable on the platform. He's relatable, but also off the platform, he's relatable. He's not afraid to show that he struggles with things. He's not trying to put himself above other people. And I think what Ryan has discovered over the last, say, seven or eight years is that when he is the most vulnerable is when people latch on to him the most, when they appreciate it the most. So he's been through some rough things. You know, he's lost his father. He's had a cancer scare. You know, his girlfriend broke up with him all kind of in this short period of time. Well, when he shared all of that, then all of a sudden he's not just this, you know, kind of good looking guy up on the stage spouting whatever about leadership or performance, he becomes now a human to people. And I think his level of talent and his ability to engage is probably his secret weapon. We can all appreciate that from an engagement standpoint. That's that's what the goal is of any presentation is not just to provide information, but to create engagement. If you create engagement, that provokes thought, that provokes yeah. questions, and then we start having a dialogue. And the great speakers of the world have always said, you know, it's all about a dialogue. You don't want it just to just be me spouting. It's about the exchange of ideas, the exchange of energy from the platform to those who are listening. Mm-hmm. Yes, indeed. It's It's important. So what's the best advice that you would give someone who's going to give a speech or a presentation that's not used to doing that or being in that role besides the breathing standpoint? Is it about the prep work? Is it about the yeah. first five seconds? I mean, w- what's the, the best advice? Yeah, it is about the prep work. And I think what can happen is if you know exactly what the first five minutes are going to be out of your mouth, then you can start to breathe a sigh of relief and you kind of get into a bit of a rhythm. Winging it is not necessarily the option, but at the same time, we don't want to have it so canned and memorized up in our brain that we're in our heads thinking about it. So like I said, I'm getting ready to go out and do my presentation later on today. And I always open with the same thing. And on my way driving to Toronto, I'll practice the first things that's going to be out of my mouth. Imagine you're having the perfect day in your life as an expert who speaks, you're standing in front of your ideal audience and we kind of go on from there. We get paid a big paycheck and there's a limousine waiting at the curb and all of that good stuff. And I will just, (laughs) (laughs) and I'll just run that whole piece in my brain because as soon as I get to the part, I actually, as they're exiting the stage to thunderous applause, and then I say cue audience thunderous applause, and then they're participating with me. (laughs) Yes. I love that you have a sound effect for everything. Uh, And then they're participating with me and they're saying to themselves, okay, not only is she saying some things that I would like, you know, I'm receiving a check for $10,000, But she's also including me in the journey. I'm participating in this. And then people shout out stuff. And and then everybody can kind of sigh that this isn't going to be a boring old speech. And so I will run that in my head, uh, you know, several times before I get there and make sure that it's that part isn't rusty. Because then after that, it's smooth sailing. And I also know where I'm going from slide to slide. And I have it kind of what we would call in, this is a coaching term, not necessarily a speaking term, but it's called in the bones. It's that you know it 
so well that it's in your bones so that when you go up, this is the big thing to remember, you're just having a conversation. That's what we want is for it to just come out like it's just you having a conversation with your audience and the less you are in your head and the more you move then into your heart and just be present for them, then I think people will really appreciate that. From a body language standpoint, are you a big believer in standing still and then like moving a couple of feet to the right or feet to the, to the left kind of in a box or depending on the personality of the, of the presenter, do you kind of give them creative license to move as long as it has meaning behind it? Well, one of the things that we know, know really works is having the power position in the middle of the stage. When you are saying something important, just stand still and just kind of stand there in your power. And that is something that is really, really helpful. We do have people that kind of pace back and forth like a, the caged tiger, and we do want to avoid that. Um, when you kind of plot out different things in the stage for different purposes, for instance, I go, I'm kind of online and then I'm offline teaching something about, did you see what I just did just then? The reason I did that is this. And so I kind of go behind the scenes, almost like a sidebar for people um, as I'm doing it. I'll do that from a particular place so that if I go over there, people know, oh, okay, she's doing a sidebar again. You know, you can have specific things kind of mapped out ahead of time. But I would say if you only need to do, use one thing, just use your power position, which is mid-stage. Okay. So let's say that we're giving a, a speech to a room of 40 to 80 people. And mm -hmm. you've got your PowerPoint at the very front. Let's say it's a hotel-style room, which is pretty average and standard. And there's not a lot of wiggle room to the side of the, the slides where they're going to be presented. Are you okay moving from the front towards the back of the room or maybe the sides? Well, there's a little bit of a danger in that once you put your back to anybody that you cut off the energy. So there's a few things that we just want to be aware of. For instance, when I ask for an AV setup, I say a small round table because they'll give you a big six foot table. Now I'm standing behind a giant six foot table trying to engage with my audience. That's not really going to work very well. So I would say when you go into your audience, just do it a little bit so that you, and then try to engage with the people. I'm always trying to reach the people in the back of the room by having having them interact with me, but I'm doing kind of seminars more than I am keynotes. When you get to the bigs, the show, then you're on a big stage and there are lights in your eyes and you can't even see the audience. That becomes a whole new bunch of tricks that need to come up your sleeve because you have to imagine how they're feeling. You have to kind of listen for the, the cues that are telling you that you're reaching them. And, and a lot of speakers feel very uncomfortable with that and will go down into the audience because of it. And I'm not saying that's wrong. You have to do it very wisely, though, so that people don't. And you have to make sure that the cameras follow you. And there's a lot of things about that that get kind of tricky. You just have to be careful. So we may be reaching back into the memory banks a really long way, or we may have done it just last week, but what was your best speech and why? What was your best speech and why? Oh, wow. That's a great question. I think for me, it was probably one of my national presentations. I've done both the NSA nationals and I've done the Canadian nationals. I think the Canadian one where I had maybe 200 people in the room. That was kind of unexpected, how many people showed up for it. And then I got a big standing ovation at the end. That made me feel really good. The reason why it went off is because I don't, I think I kind of went into it without any preconceived notions of, well, let me back up. I think what I started to get into during that point, I learned how to be more of myself on stage. How's that? And that's really good for you to know too, Alex, because you're being who you are on the stage has been something that's 
come pretty easily to you, but there are moments when you've gotten into audiences where you're thinking, oh no, I need to be a little bit more buttoned up for this audience because they're so-and-so, when in fact just being you is perfect. So I think that's why it went so well was because I did me and I didn't try to be anybody else. So let's talk about your business for a minute in terms of a wealthy speaker and the whole brand. It's just a wonderful brand. And the way that you execute it is just so, so cool. So kind of tell me about how did wealthy speaker get started and where things are like today. If somebody wanted to get in touch with, oh my gosh, it's been so great. Jay sounds like a great lady, which she is. So, so, <laughs> so give me some origin backstory and, and where we are today. Wow. Well, backstory, you have to go way back three decades ago, 30 years ago. I saw Les Brown motivational speech on PBS and I taped it on VHS. So that tells you how far ago it was. And I watched it over and over again. And I thought, oh, I was in 25 years old trying to figure out what I wanted to do career wise next. And uh, well, that's it. I want to go work for a motivational speaker. I didn't even know there was such a thing as a motivational speaker until I saw his show. It's called Live Your Dreams. And so that began three decades of learning and growing and really kind of taking on any challenge and then becoming the best at it. So I was an agent first for speakers. I represented some uh, really amazing people who went really quickly through the roof in terms of their business success. And then a lot of people started asking me if they could take me to lunch to pick my brain. I was in Texas at the time. So they'd say, can I take you to lunch and pick your brain? <laughs> and I knew you'd appreciate that. Yes. And, uh, and so I thought, hmm, I'm going to charge for this someday. And so I moved back to Canada and I started my own coaching company about 15 years ago. And it was just me at the beginning and uh, working out of my little office uh, at the time was out in Calgary. And now today we have one-on-one -on -one coaching. We have Inner Circle Masterminds, which is a year-long program for kind of intermediate speakers, people who are a little bit further along. We have a 12-week course for emerging speakers that uh, one of the people who came up through the course, Jen McDonough, runs for me now. And we have groups that run through that as well as a do-it-yourself. We have a whole line of wealthy speaker products and journals and all kinds of fun things. And so at live events, I mean, there's a lot of moving parts now. And I have a team probably of about seven people who help me, self-employed contractors who help me run the business. And it's so much fun. There's a lot of balls in the air at any given time, but there's a lot of fun going on too. Well, in case you guys don't know when you're listening, Jane is very much a high D, so she's always got something going on, always involved with things, and she does it so well and so professional, and she surrounds herself with really good people, and that's a lesson we can all learn, is that if you surround yourself with good people who are there to help support you and believe in your mission and your values, man, the sky's the limit. So just in the last 18 months since we've been working together, her brand has exploded. Everything about her business has just gone in a positive direction. So kudos to you, Jane, and your team. That's super Thank awesome. Thank you. Thank you. You know, trying to learn how to be a leader to these people is a part of you recognize that you're a driver and that you need to soften that sometimes. So um, that, that's where the disc comes in really handy. That's right. You can't always be about the whip. <laughs> sometimes you gotta you gotta just love them up a little bit and you can't be that you can't be that witchy person. You gotta just oh, it's okay. We can, we're gonna make it. It's gonna be fine. <laughs> So for those folks who want to get in touch with you, Jane, in terms of, you know, maybe setting up a, a quick little 30 minute call. They can come on over to speakerlauncher.com. And typically the first step I'll have people do is to pick up the Wealthy Speaker 2.0, which is also available on Kindle. That's a really good place to start. And then if people kind of appreciate this style of that, then they'll probably want to do more. And that's kind of the path that I followed was that go read Wealthy Speaker 2.0 and then we'll see. And so I was like, oh my gosh, enlightenment, enlightenment, page after page. And oh my gosh. And, ah! and so that kind of, that kind of sets, <laughs> set, set, sets the hook. And, and, you know, it was pretty much a, you know, yes, I need to work with this lady because she knows what she's talking about. So, uh, um, so again, Jane, this has been absolutely a blast and a pleasure for me and just can't thank you enough for all that you have done and looking to speak with you more over the next few months and years. And, and as we start to cross little different things thresholds, uh, I'm, I'm sure I'll be back on your doorstep begging for you to, to take me in. <laughs> awesome. You can be a part of our inner circle. You'll be perfect for that then. Yeah!
<laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Thanks so much to Jane for being with us, and we will see you next time. Thanks for listening to the Rapport Advantage podcast. We'd love to hear from you. Join the conversation on Facebook at the Rapport Advantage and follow us on Twitter at Rapport Podcast.